us pray. Our Father in heaven, we praise you for your Son. No one is like him. He came to earth and gave himself with his whole heart to saving us. He offered up tears and cries and prayer as he set himself to pay our debt to you. Jesus, your Son, committed himself to live our human life with all its confusions and temptations and with all the consequences of sin, but never to part in heart or will or deed from you. He offered up his whole self, committed everything of mind and soul and body and life to pay in full our debt. He offered an unblemished life as substitution for our sins, and you received him and raised him that in him we might be forgiven and restored to you. Almighty God, we praise you for your Son. Amen. Our Father in heaven, we pray for those who sorrow and who mourn. Strengthen and comfort them with the knowledge of eternal life in Christ Jesus. Be near to each in grief and help them by your word and spirit. Lord, remember the bereaved and the sick and the sorrowing. Bring healing of body and mind and spirit to them according to your great mercy. We think of those we personally know and hold them and their need before you in this moment. Release them from the trouble they face and restore to them health and wholeness and peace. Lord, with so many now watching budgets closely, with some out of work and unable to find it, Lord, with feeling the difficulties of years of credit and of loans, Father, help us to hear what you say to us in our troubles. Help us to listen to the principles of your word for helping the poorest and the weakest in society, for providing a start and a beginning for everyone, for living prudently. Lord, help us hear and obey and also change our sinful ways. Heavenly Father, whose love forgave us the first family, we pray for our families today, relationships so vital to the strength and the health of society. And we pray for those who struggle because of hurts and disappointments in relationships and in homes. Lord, be near to those who are in tears. Bring healing to them through your teaching and your spirit. And may we each become more loving and more gentle and more wise in our dealings with each other. We give you thanks for your loving mercy to us in Jesus Christ, who endured the suffering of the cross to overcome all that separates us from you and was raised up to new life. Strengthen our trust in his victory on the cross and the hope of eternal life. Help us to grow in the life which does not end in love and friendship with you and in grace towards each other. 
in this life that lasts forever through your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Our reading today comes from 1 Corinthians 10 and verses 12 to 22. Let us hear God's word. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. I speak to sensible people, judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving, for which we give thanks, a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. Consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar? Do I mean then that a sacrifice offered to an idol is anything, or that an idol is anything? No. But the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God, and I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Amen. May the Lord bless this reading of his word. Good morning and a warm welcome to see you as we gather again for worship. We're continuing in 1 Corinthians. So, says Paul, if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. These uh, sentences we read last time, and out of discussing the race and how to run it well, Paul bursts into, therefore, my friends, flee from idolatry. Paul has already written about idol food. In that passage, he was talking about caring for your brother who was less sure about their salvation and righteousness in Christ. And here, Paul is talking about something different. He is talking about actually worshipping idols. In the time of Paul, worship of other gods and idols was a normal part of life. Temples to various gods were built everywhere, and people would have thought little of worshipping several or all of the gods. One of the things the Romans found most difficult about the Jewish people was their absolute focus on one god and no others. The Romans understood having your own god, even preferring one over another. But the idea that your god and your god alone was the only god, that was a problem. In Corinthians, Paul is writing into a society that thinks that Roman way and to Christians who have come out of that society. So though it might seem strange to us today, Paul has to make clear that worshipping Christ is exclusive. You can't be a Christian and a worshipper of other gods. I speak to sensible people, he says, judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. As Paul writes of how to run the race well, and having taught that we cannot have the attitude of the Israelites who wanted back into Egypt, Paul also says, worship Christ and worship Christ only. This is bigger than simply don't worship other gods. It is about our relationship to Christ, that we are in Christ Jesus. So understand, we don't worship other idols or gods, but that is not because of anything about the other idols or gods. What idol or what is believed about them, that's irrelevant to why we don't worship them. 
We don't worship them because we do belong to Christ Jesus because of his work for us. And that is exclusive. Once his, all his. Once in the race, all in the race. Paul teaches this through the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, which Jesus commanded. And he says two things about it. We participate in the blood of Christ and we participate in the body of Christ. What do we share as Christians? What makes you and I both Christians? It is the fact that Christ is in you and Christ is in me. It is our relationship to him. It is not our relationship to each other. It is, our, it is not our attending the same church. What unites us is Christ in you and Christ in me. Now, if we have been paying attention through the letter here, we ought to make sense, and this ought to all make sense to us now. Everything ought to slot into place. Righteousness in Christ and all our righteousness in Jesus alone the sovereign grace plan of God and how he reached out to you, our care for our brother's race and how we run our own race, and the very nature of that race and journey being our sanctification based on the saving work of Christ alone. It all ought to click into place. Give it time and think about it, but it should click into place. When we get together to celebrate the sacrament Jesus has commanded, we are each of us obeying his command. We are each of us being led by his Spirit and called by him. We are each of us acting on his command. This is because he is in each of us and we are in him. An important word in the New Testament is the word koinonia. It means shared, common, part of, fellowship with, belonging to. It is the word Paul uses here for participation in the blood and the body of Christ. Do you see in the salvation work Christ died on the cross to pay our debt and to redeem us and to provide us with righteousness? By his sovereign grace plan, God reached out with the good news of Christ down through the ages, and he sought you out. By the Holy Spirit, he awakened you to repent of your sin and to trust in Jesus. He has come to dwell in you and given you a new heart and a new will by the Holy Spirit and his word. And now you are on a race to his unpacking of his righteousness into your life as he completely saves you, heart and soul. Do you see the bond he has with you and you now have with him? He is the vine and we are the branches. By its very nature, it is exclusive. It is exclusive and it is going somewhere. Christ is going to raise for God a people of his own, whose hearts are his reign, whose bodies are made everlasting. If you are in this everlasting kingdom of God, it is absolutely exclusive. Flee idolatry, Paul says. You are sensible people, he says. You understand that you are in Christ and Christ is in you. You are his now and he is yours. It is plain common sense that you cannot worship anyone or anything else when Christ is in you and you are in him. Consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat sacrifices participate in the altar? To sit and eat with someone in the ancient world was to signal fellowship between you. Deals and agreements would be celebrated and signed by fellowship in a meal. In a way, this was part of worship sacrifices too. Paul reminds them that the people of Israel were God's people through each making offering and sacrifice at the altar and sharing in the sacrifice. It marked their covenant and relationship to God. Paul points out he doesn't want to suggest that there's anything magical or mystical or power here, nor that sacrifices or idols or anything at all. 
but the offerings and sacrifices and religious feasts of other worship is not being made to God. In fact, unwittingly idol worshippers worship demons. Not that there's some specific demon behind each idol, but that all worship directed away from God is unwittingly playing right into the will of demons who wish to draw people away from God. The point is, it's not worship of God. These things are mutually exclusive. You cannot have both. You worship God only. Do you remember that I was saying about the heart things, that one of the heart things is a singleness of heart to God, an audience of one. See this then and see that it is important. Worship of God is based on truth, the truth about Jesus and his death for our sin, his resurrection and the ascension and his return. And all these things, all these truths are told and marked in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. His death and payment for our sin in the bread and in the wine, our repentance and faith as we take the bread and wine, his resurrection and ascension and his return in the very fact that we obey the command to keep the sacrament until he returns his abiding in us and us in him, told in our taking of the bread and wine at his command. The truth of the gospel is told in the action. Worship of God is based on truth in Christ Jesus. And you cannot separate the true worship of God and the truth in Christ. This is absolutely a statement of having an audience of one one only whom we regard as God. This should come out in our actions and in our words. We should not participate in idol worship. In fact, we should flee from it. More than that, Paul explains that in celebrating the Lord's table, we are sharing together and sharing in Christ. He is our worship, our one, and we are his. How will he regard it if we worship any other? Paul even asks, are we trying to arouse his jealousy? Christ will seek us if we wander astray. He cares about us. And hearing loudly the warning to flee idol worship, we may miss the reason why. The reason why is that now we are in Jesus. Nothing can be better than just that. He abides in us too. We are precious to him. He calls us from other worships to the one that will heal us, to the one that was always meant for us and us for it, to worship God with all our heart and soul and mind. Still and silence all but Christ within your will. An audience of one. We are in the life of Christ and under his grace and care, we want and should live his reign in us, the heart things. We cannot mix this with a heart for other things of this world. Singleness of will to God only and love of him, a pure heart. We can only have that pure heart for Christ who saved us, who is working in us, who will redeem us. It's exclusive. To try leaning into God's sovereign grace plan without realizing that it is about that fellowship with him, shared in the meal, in the sacrament, shared in worship, without realizing it is about fellowship with and love and worship of God, that it is friendship with God, would be to risk again falling into tick-boxing, into self-righteousness. We have an audience of one, our Savior, and we are working with him on his work in us. Flee all other idols. Today, those idols might not be a statue. 
It might be opinions and views and attitudes of the world. Give them up. We are caught up in worship now. It's all love and grace now. Leaning fully into the sovereign grace plan of God is about worship and fellowship and love of him. So love him, lots. Have an audience of one. Each day, look to Christ. Love him only. Forget the world and all its crazy idols. You have only one worship, the Lord whom you love and who loves you. Let us pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we bless you for Christ our Saviour, your Son and our Redeemer. Lord, forgive us for having other idols and other desires, for playing to other audiences, this singleness of heart that you desire from us. Lord, lead us into it, and may it become the cornerstone of all our thinking and all our life as we realize more and more how we are now in Christ and he in us. As we realize, Lord Jesus, how much we love you, how much you have loved us, and that you are all our hope for this life and the next, Lord, may all other idols disappear, and may we have a heart only for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.